uh, who's, I think it was her daughter, was coming to Toronto for Torah tours for, for Shavuos. And I asked where, uh, where she's going to be for Torah tours. And, they, um, and uh, her, her father, her mother said they think it's going to be a Shari I named a bunch of shuls. And they said, oh, they think it's going to be Shari Tfila. And I wrote them this long, glowing email about Rabbi Lipner and all the things he does and how wonderful it would be that she's going to be here for Shavuos. And she, turns out that actually, um, it's a different shul. <laughs> but um, after I had written that long email, I ended up having to, to, to say something nice about another rabbi and I had to build it up now that I had described Rabbi Lipner so much. But, um, but really, Rabbi Lipner has been a wonderful friend for the Y.U. Torah Mitzion Beit Midrash Zichron Dov since our inception uh, and uh, does so much for the community. It's an honor to be able to give something back by, by being here um, Slichos night and I also am grateful because it helps keep me awake until Slichos. So uh, doub- doubly grateful for the opportunity also to the shul itself for being a good home for Shiurim from the members of our Beit Midrash over the years. Adam Friedman the last couple of years uh, giving his weekly shear and as Rabbi Lipner mentioned, Rabbi Alex Hecht uh, will be here next Shabbos and hopefully we'll have a, uh, a role in an ongoing way at Shari Tefillah. And I, I would also, of course, want to, to echo the thanks to the Anhang family and all the Nishamos that are being commemorated uh, should have an aliyah. So I thought I'd start off with a piece of a poem which you have on your sheets, hopefully, in the first source. This is from T.S. Eliot. In the U.S., this is a standard when you're in high school. I don't know if it's, uh, if it's the same here in the Canadian curriculum. People are familiar with the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock? This is somewhat familiar? Okay, I see some hands. Okay. So this is an excerpt from the, from the poem. The speaker is, of course, J. Alfred Prufrock himself. He's bothered. There's a question he wants to ask. And scholars generally assume that the question that's being referred to by T.S. Eliot here is a proposal. He wants to propose marriage to someone. And here he goes. And indeed there will be time to wonder, do I dare? And do I dare? Time to turn back and descend the stair. With a bald spot in the middle of my hair, they will say how his hair is growing thin. My morning coat, my collar mounting firmly to the chin, my necktie rich and modest but asserted by a simple pin. They will say, but how his arms and legs are thin. Do I dare disturb the universe? And then I skipped a little bit. Should I, after tea and cakes and ices, have the strength to force the moment to its crisis? But though I have wept and fasted, wept and prayed, though I have seen my head, grown slightly bald, brought in upon a platter, I am no prophet, and here is no great matter. I have seen the moment of my greatness flicker, and I have seen the eternal footman hold my coat and snicker, and in short, I was afraid." What's the mood of the speaker here? Sorry? Insecure. Trepidation. He's afraid to make a move. He's afraid to ask the question. And in fact, as the poem proceeds, we find out he never does ask the question. He can't push himself to that point. He describes himself here, descending the stair and what people are going to say about him. He describes how he is sharply dressed, prepared for the moment. But they will say how his arms and legs are thin. This is somebody who has a problem. What is he afraid of? What causes the insecurity? Sorry? Rejection. He's afraid of what people are going to say, and he seeks to reinforce himself with sweets. Not a bad idea, table in the back. He seeks to reinforce himself with religion. He fasts and prays. He reinforces himself with thoughts of his own aging and death. And still he can't bring himself to make the move that he wants to make. He is afraid of being laughed at. He is afraid of being rejected. And this is, of course, a natural human trait. Comes up in Judaism, and particularly at this time of year... When we think about tshuva, when we think about repentance, I brought you a line from the Talmud in source number two from a much larger story, the story of Elisha ben Avuya. 
Elisha ben Avuya was none other than the mentor of Rabbi Meir. Rabbi Meir, who was one of the most important people in the history of the transmission of Torah. Rabbi Meir's main student was Rabbi Yudah Hanasi, recorder of the Mishnah, leader of the Jews in the end of the second century common era. So Elisha ben Avuya is a very important person in his own right. However, at one point, he abandons everything. He loses faith. A discussion for another time. But after he has lost faith, he has a thought at one point of tshuva. He has a thought of repentance. Until he hears a divine voice. In source number two, as the Gemara in Chagiga records it, Yatis Abbas Kol Amra, a voice emerged, the small voice, a bat kol, daughter of a voice, so to speak as the Ron explains. A, do- a small voice comes out of heaven and says, Shuvu banim shovavim, which is a biblical verse, return wayward children, chutz me'acher, except for acher, the other, which is the way that Elisha ben Avuya comes to be known. He can't repent. Omar and he said, Ho v'itrat ahugabra me'ahu alma, since I'm chased away from that world, I'll go enjoy this world. He says, I have been kicked out. I'm not accepted. I am rejected. I'm not going to push. Why should I force my way in where I am not wanted? I'm going to go somewhere else. And so he decides repentance is beyond him. And that's what I want to talk about tonight. Is fear of rejection, like Prufrock in T.S. Eliot, like Elisha ben Avuya here in the Gemara, and how Yom Kippur and the process of building up to Yom Kippur crushes the fear of rejection and empowers us to do what we are bad at. This is an epiphany that occurred to me a few weeks ago. I never really thought about it this way. I don't know where it came from. It was out of the blue. When was the last time you chose to do something that you do poorly? When was the last time you chose to do something that you're bad at doing? No one who is under 18 is allowed to answer this question for a reason I will get to. But does anyone here ever do anything that they know they don't do well? Can you give, someone give, I I don't don't want anyone to embarrass themselves. Can someone give me an example of something that they do by choice that they don't do well? Right. By choice? Is that by choice? Actually, I mean, you speak for many Trentonians in this regard, but uh, but I don't think it's by choice necessarily. Yes. I'm not good at tennis at all. But when my grandson wanted to play tennis with me, so I said okay. Right. So you overcame. The, the feeling of, I don't play tennis well because your grandson wanted you to do it. There was a sufficient incentive to get you to do that. Much like the driving case, although a much better incentive, I would say. Good. See, as kids, we do things that we do poorly all the time. Because we don't have a choice. We're forced into it as children, Right? I, let's say, don't do, uh, let's say I'm not good at chemistry. Well, it's in the curriculum, I'm going to have to do it. Don't do well at math, too bad. You have to learn math, that's the way it goes. Don't like public speaking? (laughs) Your bar mitzvah, your bat mitzvah is coming up, and you are going to give a speech, it doesn't make a difference. You don't like sports? Sorry, we signed you up for Little League. Right? Generally speaking, you will have to engage in sports, and not only that, it will be in front of a crowd. Sitting still in a public setting, right? You're going to have to go to shul. You're going to have to go to one program or another. Children tend to be forced into situations in which they do things that they don't do well. Whether it's so that they will learn in school or whether it's simply because these are the rules of the game. But then we become adults. And as adults... We shape much of our lives, not everything, because we don't control everything, but we shape as much of our lives as we control toward our strengths. So we pursue a career in an area where we have some aptitude. 
If we don't like math, we use a calculator. We associate with friends with whom we are comfortable. We go to places where we feel at home. We avoid public activities that might be embarrassing. We narrow the field of what we do, by and large, not entirely, but by and large, to areas where we're not afraid there's going to be a penalty for doing badly. Value judgment. Is it good or bad to refrain from pursuits that you find to be difficult or that you find that you don't do well? Good. Good. Entirely depends. No, I can't work with that. Yes. Ah, one thing a challenge. I'm going to come back to why one would do one way or the other soon. Yes. Doing something you do badly so you'll get better at it. Good. I'm asking, uh, you're ahead of me by a step with those answers. Is it good or bad to avoid the things you do poorly? Yeah. You can be surprised. Absolutely. Yes. Bad. Bad. Okay. Why? Because you'll never improve. Okay, let's, I'll tell you what. Let's take it this way. Sorry? Let's take it this way. What are the reasons why it's good to follow the model of J. Alfred Prufrock? Why is it good to avoid things that we're bad at? Sorry? You stay comfortable. This is true. First of all, you avoid rejection and embarrassment, right? That's a good thing. We avoid being embarrassed. That we can take as a general positive in life. Also, though, things that we are bad at are often the areas that don't bring us fulfillment. They don't make us feel fulfilled, maybe because we, you know, it's, it's a cause and effect question, right? Chicken and egg. Is it, I never became good at it because I don't find it fulfilling? Or is it, I don't find it fulfilling because I'm not good at it? But take a look at source number three, please. Rabbi Naftali Tzvi Yehuda Berlin. It's a fascinating comment. It's a beautiful statement that he makes, which has applications in many areas in Judaism. He's talking about one of the blessings that Bilam gave the Jews. Bilam said of the Jews that we are keganot alei nahar, like gardens by a stream or by a river. And he said something remarkable, all the more remarkable based on where he lived. You see, the Nitziv, Rabbi Berlin, lived in Russia at the end of the 19th century. I'm not sure in Volazhin just what the Jews did in terms of gardening. But he is going to hold forth on the nature of gardens and the aesthetics of designing a garden. He says... He says, when you plant a garden, every garden has a particular variety that is the central variety. And around that central variety, you plant others in small amounts. And the colors will all blend nicely with each other, but you have your central color and your central flower, and then the others will sort of work their way around it. And again, I guess this was the style of gardening in Volusian. But he says, Kach kol ish Yisrael male mitzvos Hashem. He says, so to every Jew. This is why we are compared to gardens by a river. He says, every Jew is filled with the mitzvos of Hashem. But everyone has a particular mitzvah that resonates with them more. And that's the one that they will be especially careful with. So even though all of us are commanded in all 613, nonetheless, for some people, chesed really resonates. For some people, davening really resonates. For some people, learning Torah will especially resonate. And not just in terms of these big fields of mitzvot, but even getting narrower, down to specifics, people will find a particular mitzvah that is theirs. And when the Torah says, when Bilam says, we are like gardens, it means that 
we will have this diversity of different pursuits religiously. However, there will be a central one that, that, that resonates and that works for us. And each person will have their own, where they find fulfillment. Along similar lines, one of the main students of the Nitziv, Rav Avram Yitzchak HaKohen Cook, wrote a beautiful poem in source number four, which I like to think of at this time of year because it has shofar in the title. El Chiki Shofar. I brought you only a piece. It's a rather long poem. But the, po- the theme of the poem is that each individual has to do what resonates with them. And so he writes... We will not measure every acquisition based on our personal measure. I'm not going to measure everything that others find value in based on what I find value in. We know that each person is only one. One portion. A share of our community. He says, the community can't judge the individual. Each one is going to have to find what resonates. Each one is going to have to, defi- is going to, have to define what works personally. Each person will go to whatever he desires, and that's where he'll succeed. And you can read the rest of it there. But the point that he makes, which is the point that his Rebbe, the Nitziv, makes as well, is that we do, and we specialize in, that which we find fulfilling. So if somebody says, I don't want to do what I'm bad at, this doesn't work for me, there's reason for them to do that. There's reason for, reason for them to narrow themselves somewhat. Yes? There's very good reason for that. Because their own fulfillment will be greater, mm-hmm. and the community will benefit more by your doing what you are good at, instead of spinning your wheels. What you are better at. Everyone is better off. Very good. There's an additional element here, which I will now jump to since you, since you mention it, which is... If people are going to force themselves to do the things that they're bad at, it's inefficient, and they lose personally, and others lose as well. Take a look at source number six, the Rambam. The truth is, I can sum up number five very quickly. Number five is another similar thought of Rav Cook, who talks about how if a person says, I'm not going to follow my nature, I'm going to force myself not to follow who I am, that is, as he calls it, hachet hayoter gadol, the greatest sin. Remarkably strong words. But take a look at number six. The Rambam is speaking of the mitzvah of learning Torah, and he says, Hayahu wrote selu mod Torah. If someone wants to learn Torah, V'yesh lo ben lil mod Torah, and he also has a son who needs to learn Torah. So who could they live no? You are first, and then your child, unlike on the, uh, no, like on the airplane, right? That is like on the airplane, right? You put on your own mask, then you put on the mask for the, uh, for, for the child. The uh, same way here, you learn Torah, and then you work on the child. However, if your child is sharper, if your child is more insightful and intelligent, then instead send the child to learn. That doesn't mean you stop. You still have a mitzvah to learn, but invest in the child's studies. Meaning, the better disposition of resources is to send it to the person who's going to do well, as opposed to taking it for yourself when you're not the one who will be able to do it best. And in fact, the Shulchan Aruch, in an extreme, take a look at source number seven, the Code of Jewish Law writes, Mi she'i'ev shalo lil mod, if someone can't really learn, mipnei she'ineodea klal lil mod, because he doesn't know how. O mipnei atirdos she'yeshlo, or because he's distracted, so let him fund other people who are going to go learn. I'm surprised. I would have expected the Shulchan Aruch to say, Torah is the province of every Jew, and even if you don't learn well, you tough it out. He says, no, go pay for somebody else to learn. He means maybe learning many, many hours. Everyone has to learn. Right. So I think everyone does have to learn, and I think that's, that's the point that the Rambam is making in number six as well. 
But he's not saying, push yourself. I think there is a recognition of practicality. So that there is reason for somebody not to force themselves to do things that they don't do well. In terms of their personal frustration and fulfillment, sorry? Like getting up early to go to school. (laughs) <laughs> so right if I don't get up early if I don't get up well in the morning maybe I shouldn't push myself maybe I shouldn't force myself For, fortunately there's another side of the coin and the other side of the coin is the downside to refraining from things that we're bad at and we already heard some people mention um, mention elements of this first of all and I guess this speaks to getting up early to go to shul in the realm of mitzvot each mitzvah is obligatory <laughs> Right? And mitzvot have lessons in value. If we stop trying new things, right? if the one whose kid is going to learn better says, well, I'm not going to learn at all, then the result is that, uh, that they're never going to develop that, that, that uh, skill. They're never going to gain the benefits of learning. But beyond mitzvot, in general, if someone isn't going to, to try that which they are bad at, they're going to miss opportunities. They're going to miss novelties. They're going to miss thrills. They're going to miss relationships. There's a great loss in not trying something new, right? And how will we learn what we can do if we stop trying new things? How will we adapt and change, right? What if Rabbi Akiva stopped when he was Akiva, right? He's 40 years old. He hasn't been learning. He is, uh, you know, depending on which version of the story you look at, you know, Rachel says to him, you can marry me if you learn, or he sees the, uh, the stone that's had the, the water dripped on it, the, uh, and he says, yeah, you know, Torah can really accomplish a lot. I wish them luck. And he goes on his way, and we lose Rabbi Akiva as a result of that. Playing it safe has a cost in terms of our experiences, And also, playing it safe has a steep emotional cost. What I mean by that is perhaps best captured in number eight. Towards the end of that poem, the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock. I grow old. I grow old. This is after he has gone for years and years without making that that proposal. I shall wear the bottoms of my trousers rolled. He has made a decision. This is his firm decision. Shall I part my hair behind? Do I dare to eat a peach? I shall wear white flannel trousers and walk upon the beach. And what you see here in the poem at this stage is that he's been reduced to asserting himself, to making decisions about trivialities, about things that don't matter. I have decided I'm going to wear the bottoms of my trousers rolled. I'm going to wear white flannel trousers and walk upon the beach, but anything that matters, or even some of the inconsequential things, shall I eat a peach or not, those he can't bring himself to do, it makes us timid when we play it safe. And there's a risk of boredom. Dr. Viktor Frankl, famous certainly for for Man's Search for Meaning, but he wrote much more than that, wrote in his book, the doctor, and it, it, it was a paper, The Doctor and the Soul, in source number nine. You know, his, uh, his classic main idea within logotherapy, the idea that people have to have a sense of mission, something that they find meaning in, that they are trying to achieve. So he says here, we must never be content with what has already been achieved. Life never ceases to put new questions to us, never permits us to come to rest. A person who says, I can't go further, I can't try new things, is going to find himself bored, stagnant, stifled. Doesn't work. I brought you a similar quote from Rav Cook in number 10, but I think I've made the point. The challenge for us at this point, then, is we've seen that that there's an element of timidity that we are vulnerable to, a fear of doing things that we are bad at. It's something that we tend to avoid in life if we can avoid it, and we stop after childhood largely trying things that we know we are bad at because we are afraid of ridicule, because we find they're not fulfilling, because we find them to be a waste of resources. 
But ultimately, it can shrink us and narrow us as people and rob us of experiences. It can rob us of expansion. So this is where we come to Slichos and Yom Kippur. And what I think of as I put on the sheet, license to do our worst. I believe that Judaism is fundamentally an optimistic religion. We look at ourselves and we look at the world as entities which have the capacity and not just the capacity but the mandate to grow and to evolve and to improve. And that it's something which is going to happen. Take a look, please, at source number 11. The Gemara in Shabbos, Rabbi Gamliel, speaks of a future time. Yosef, Rabbi Gamliel, the Kadarish. Rabbi Gamliel, one of the major sages of the first century common era, sitting at a time when the Jews are falling to the Romans, being crushed by the Roman Empire. Look at what Rabbi Gamliel says. Yosef, Rabbi Gamliel, the Kadarish. Asida Isha Shetele Bechol Yom. He says, you know what's going to happen in the future? Women will give birth daily. He means the same woman giving birth daily. That's what he's talking about. He says it's a pasuk. It's a biblical verse. The woman who has conceived and the woman giving birth all together. Visu Yasiv Rabban Gamliel Vikadarish and he taught another lesson as well. Asidim Ilanos Shemotzi and Peros Bakoyom. Trees will produce fruit daily. Fruit will always be in season. Shanamar as the Pasuk says, Vinasa Anaf, Vyasa Peri, it will produce branches and bear fruit right away. Ma anaf bakoyom, the branches there daily, the fruit will be there daily as well. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I'm sorry. That's, yes, I, I, I should clarify that. Thank you. Yes, that is what, it, what indeed is, uh, is suggested here. And parenthetically, it's been suggested that this is also a prediction of what technologically is becoming possible um, and sooner than people realize. The, the idea of an artificial uterus as something that can be used to, to speed up birth is actually not that far away. And certainly the technology for, for producing fruit on a much shorter time scale um, is also not that far away. But my point in bringing this is not to discuss the, uh, you know, the, the vision of a messianic time as much as to point out the, the firmness with which Rabbi Gamliel speaks and of the texts that he's drawing on. It's a given that this is going to happen. Not an if. Asid, this is what the world is going to look like. This is where things are going. That's what Rabbi Gamliel is saying. In source number 12, the most optimistic of statements, a pasuk in Yeshaya, Bila Hamavas Lanetzach. Hashem is going to destroy death forever. Macha Hashem Elohim Dimam Me'al Kalpanim, and God will wipe away tears from all faces. These are statements about the future that look at the world as a place that will be improved. And, when it comes to tshuva as well, when it comes to the mistakes we've made, righting those wrongs and being forgiven, we have the same optimism, the same idea. If you take a look at source number 13, Marin Kiddushin, man says to a woman, to marry him, al shani tzaddik, on condition that I am a tzaddik, that I am righteous. Afilu rasha gamur, even if he is fully wicked, mikudeshes, assuming she accepts, he's married. Shema hear her tshuva bedaito, because maybe he had thoughts of repentance in his mind. The fact that he thought of repentance is sufficient for him to be considered tzaddik. For him to be considered righteous. Just the fact that he thought of it. This is already predicted in the Torah. Take a look at source number 14, flipping the page. You will return to Hashem your God. You will hear His voice. In accord with all that I command you today. You, your children. With all your heart, with all your soul. Hashem promises. You are going to return. You know, this morning we read in Shul, the Tochacha, this horrific 
passage in which we are told about terrible things that are going to happen, and it ends without any sort of pick-me-up. It ends without, and then you're going to be good. But the next week's Parsha, the one that you see here in source number 14, promises you will return. And when you do, V'shav Hashem alokecha shvusecha v'richamecha Hashem is going to bring you back. And He will have mercy upon you. V'shav v'kibetzcha mikol ha'amim He will gather you from all the nations. And you know, for centuries, people read this and said, can it be, can it be? But we've seen it in our own day. We've seen the fulfillment of what, for centuries, was simply a statement of optimism. That's what we're told here. The world ultimately can and will be improved. And to take it from the national back to the personal. Source number 15. The Rambam writing about what tshuva is. says, Umayi ha-tshuva, what is repentance? Hu shi'azov ha-chotei cheto v'yasiro mimachshavto. Tshuva is, for the sinner to abandon his sin, take it out of his thoughts, yigmor belibo shalo yaseyu o, to conclude that he's not going to do it again. V'yayid alav yodea ta'alumos shalo yashuv l'zeh achet le'olam. And the one who knows all secrets, Hashem testifies that this person will not come back to it ever again. How naive is God about whether we're going to come back to the sin or not? I'm not going to ask people. I will answer for myself that I know, because I keep my list from year to year of all the things that I need to work on, that I conclude, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, I'm going to work on this this year. And I look back on it, Slicho's time, every year, and I know how many things are still on that list. Ya'id alav yodea ta'alumos. Hashem is still optimistic. He looks at us and says, I know that your intent is... I know that at this moment your status is of somebody who is not going to go back and make that mistake again. Or in source number 16, to draw on Rav Cook once again from his Arod HaTshuva on repentance, he says, Ha'olam muhrach hu lavo lidei tshuva shlema. He says, the world is muhrach. The world is guaranteed to come to complete tshuva. May take a while, but it's guaranteed. Ein ha'olam davar omed al matzav echad. The world does not remain in one place. Kim holechu mitpateach. It perpetually evolves. In the thought of Rav Kook, the world is progressing. And for all the terrible headlines, and for all the disasters we see unfolding the world over, Rav Kook's words resonate. Because they fit with everything we see going back to Tanakh and working our way forward. We see it in Rabban Gamliel with his prediction of what's going to happen in the future. We see it in the Rambam's description of Tshuva. The idea that, yes, Judaism takes an optimistic view of the world and says that, yes, Tshuva is guaranteed. Now look, not everything can be repaired. That's the truth of it. Not everything can be fixed. And so if you take a look at number 17, you see I brought you from the Rambam. He's quoting the Rebbe of his father, the Rif, who said, 24 acts prevent repentance. There are 24 areas where repentance is really hard to do. And he starts you on the list. He says, Arba mehen avon gadol. Four of these are such terrible sins. And these areas, you sin, Hashem is going to make it, is not going to provide you with support. You're going to have to work really hard to be able to repent. And what are his four? So, first one is Mahti Asarabim, someone who causes the masses to sin. The second is somebody who leads somebody else who had been on a good path into a bad path. A third one is somebody Somebody who doesn't educate his children, because the Rambam believes that your children are in your control, your mileage may vary. The, uh, the fourth one is somebody who says, I'm going to sin and then repent, and he acknowledges that. He says, some things are really hard to atone for. However, at the end of his list of 24, he says... Shuvah is never impossible. I should have brought you the end of his list as well on here. He says, at the end of the list, he says, Shuvah is still always going to be possible. 
Granted, a person should never say, don't worry about it, God's going to forgive me. I brought that from Rav Cook in number 18. But this is the point. Because we are promised that errors can be corrected, not only that, because we are promised that errors will be corrected, we don't need to be afraid to do our worst. What Slichos, Yom Kippur, promise us is that it's safe for a person to say, I'm going to try it, even if I am bad at it. Even if it's not something I do well. So that can apply in general, to pursuits in general, and tennis and, uh, and driving. But it can especially apply within the context of Torah. You had a relationship with somebody. The relationship fell apart. Something terrible happened yesterday, a month ago, or ten years ago. We can try to rebuild a relationship. A person can get involved in community leadership and not be afraid. What if I make a mistake and people are going to think that I'm a fool? A person can tackle a new shear. I'm going to try Dafyomi. Yeah, maybe you'll fall asleep during the shear. Possible. Maybe you won't follow. It's also possible. Maybe you'll try Dafyomi and it'll turn out to be Dafyomi because you went for one day. Could be. Still worth trying. It's still, that's what Yom Kippur says. It's still worth trying. To work on a mida, to work on an attribute that has been hard until now. Anger, getting up in the morning, whatever it is. So yeah, you may backslide. Still worth it. Because we're still promised that Hashem is going to accept and we're still promised that tshuva is going to succeed. It just may take a while. Rather than end up like Prufrock, too timid to grow, we can make that move because we're promised its success. I'll conclude with one point. The, uh, the piece that I brought you in number 19 from Rav Nassim Svi Frinkel, the altar of Slabodka. The... Uh, I should note, the, uh, because I saw it in the lobby, but I saw it got covered up, so I want to make sure people are aware. It's now, believe it or not, the 10th year of our Bay Midrash. The, uh, so our 10th year of Toronto Torah is now being published in the, uh, in the shuls every week. And it's there out in the lobby and uh, on the table every week, and people should please pick it up. One of the things that we include in Toronto Torah, and this is the reason I'm holding it up, is we include a biography of some scholar who wrote, who published, and a piece of something they published along with a translation. So I happened to take the one that was, uh, that was from this week, from Renaissance Svi Finkel. If you want to know more about him, his bio is in there, and you can pick it up on the table outside. But he's talking about the... Uh, he quotes you, well, he quotes a medrash which speaks about how when Adam and Chava ate from the fruit, they stood for judgment, and then they were pardoned. That's what the Medrash in Vayikra Rabbah says. Adam and Chava were judged for eating from the fruit, and they were pardoned. And he asks the obvious question. Adam and Chava were pardoned? Were they? I'm asking you now. Were Adam and Chava pardoned? No. Right? They got terrible punishments. The world was punished for it. We're told the land is cursed and it doesn't produce well now. And, and pregnancy, sure, yes, they are told you will be able to create. You want it to be godlike? You want it to be able to bring life into the world the way that God did? Sure you can. Chava, you can do it, but it's going to be painful. Adam, you can bring life from the ground, but it's going to require your blood and your sweat. Right? That's what happens. There's no pardoning going on. So, Nassim Svi Finkel seeks to address the problem with what I brought you here in source number 19. He says, you know what? It's true that they suffered for it, but they remained alive. And that in and of itself is a gift. He says, as I, uh, I'm bringing you the translation here, after all of the descending and falling, a wonderful power remains stored within him. 
in the human being with which he can mend the distortion of his sin and straighten all that is crooked to wear his true form without reduction and diminution of his height he can return to his strength and be elevated with all of creation and if he has this wonderful power then when he is granted life he has already won in judgment he has been pardoned for life is the pardon itself our conclusion is this all who are connected to life have hope it's a famous phrase in Hebrew. He says, Kol hachayim, yesh bitachon. As long as a person is connected to life, there is indeed hope. And that's what enables us to move forward. So as we begin slichot, this is what allows us to make new commitments. It's what allows us to look back at a year and more than a year of failure and say, I'm going to try again. And ultimately, that empowers us to embark upon repentance and to embark upon change. I wish everybody a year of change, a year of growth, and a year of doing things that we are bad at. Thank you very much.